we rolling? Action. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> so, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for this incredible show. I'm already getting emotional just looking at faces. Oh my God. <laughs> Truly, you know, the work that you have done is so extraordinary, it's just so special and so real and relatable to families like mine who went through Alzheimer's and dementia and what you guys put on screen as a family who are navigating it with such grace and such honesty was so moving and so important to anyone who's going through this disease. So I'll start by saying thank you for that. In this country, there are an estimated 53 million family caregivers and close to 11 million caregivers for someone with Alzheimer's and dementia. And so, these people have often, and I can say this with personal experience, felt underrepresented in storytelling. And so I'm so excited to sit and have this conversation with you guys. I would love to know what types of caregiving experiences you guys have had in your real lives, anything that you brought to this, you know, as a writer, as actors. Oh no, I'm gonna get emotional. Now you're... Don't Rach. nab it. Rach. 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 Two minutes. Um, my mom uh, suffered a stroke about four and a half years ago and um, she has aphasia. It's hard because she's not as mobile as she used to be and obviously not as communicative. And like you lost a half of your mom, but like she's still there. And that's like a really difficult part. Every day is something different. Mm. Every day you face a new challenge. Um, boy, has it been a journey. Yeah. I mean, it must be so hard to have that, you know, under the surface while you're telling this story. But at the same time, if I can say, I think it probably made everything so much more special and so much more real. Oh, so. yeah. KJ, what about you? Uh, so I have a close family member who's going through Alzheimer's, and uh, this person I cannot name, which is part of the discussion today, right? Because the version of them with whom I interact today won't know what she's giving permission to. Mm -hmm. um, and so then you have to do all of this calculus, right? There's the version of her strongest, sharpest self what would she have wanted? And of course, my opinion about that is different than another loved one's opinion about that and another loved one's opinion about that. And you have to like dig through who this person was and imagine the dignity that she held and the grace and the brilliance and like, I don't know. So it's just a guessing game. And it's yeah. a cruel, like on the buffet of cruel things about this disease that is like, I think the family members and the caregivers and the loved ones and the friends are always guessing yeah. what dignity looks like for this human being. My mom was diagnosed with Alzheimer's at 55, um, and she was a teacher for many years, and she was, you know, a member of her school boards and our synagogue board, and she was a very active mom, and she was very in control of her life until this disease started to take over, and she did not want us to tell anyone and she had a lot of shame about it, and we had to carry that and keep it a secret for a long time. But I, as a storyteller, really struggled with that. Eventually, once she was progressed enough, kind of just had to start talking about it, right? And like, had to dig deep inside to what you said, to what was at my mom's core, which was she was a teacher. She was someone who would knock on doors for presidential elections, mm -hmm. you know, she was a fighter. And I had to make a choice that ultimately she would want us to fight back That's right. and do something and honor her that way instead of just keeping it a secret. Mm -hmm. Mandy, what about you? Fun caregiving stories? <laughs> <laughs> I somehow don't have a personal connection with caregiving at this juncture of my life, but it's not lost on me the, the responsibility I think that we all sort of collectively have to tell a story and just to show this particular story, especially considering the platform that a show like ours sort of has and serves in the world. Yeah. It's been a beautiful part of the legacy of this show that I'm really, really, really proud to be a part of. And I will say you are a caregiver, you're a mother. Yeah. Yeah. I am, so, I guess, <laughs> yeah. I was just viewing it in one context, yes. I am a caregiver forever now for the rest of my life. <laughs> John, sad stories. <laughs> Uh, the best kind of story. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've been pretty close to it now for the last, I would say, five years. My father-in-law, who lived very close to my wife and I, he was diagnosed with uh, dementia. And I remember being, you know, him telling me that he was a veteran, and me being a veteran, I, you know, I deal with the VA all the time, and they have this amazing facility that was able to take him in. And my mom as well, like, both have been diagnosed with 
um, dementia at this point, so we're both kind of dealing with that. And you know, we try to spend as much time with her as possible because of the different stages. You know, the things that she deals with, like paranoia or memory. You know, if we're there, we feel like it, it helps her to hold on to these things. I mean, it's just it's amazing how caregiving has touched Everyone. all of our lives, right? Yeah. Like in any form, we've all been caregivers. We will need to receive care. It is such a universal story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even, I mean, I grew up in an intergenerational immigrant household, and my grandparents played a huge role in raising me. And, like, I grew up watching Wheel of Fortune every night with my grandfather um, and watching NBA games with my grandmother. And as they grew older, we were all involved in trying to find the right care for them. And then when my grandfather lost his sight, we just couldn't find the right supports for him and had to put him in a nursing home against his wishes. Mm. And that heartbreak is something that my family lives with and so much a part of why I do this work is that we have this reality in our country where every day 10,000 people turn 65. We're living longer than ever before because mm -hmm. of advances in healthcare and technology. We've basically added a whole generation onto our lifespan but changed nothing about our culture or our policies to support it, like right. a dignified quality of life mm -hmm. as we live longer. And it just means that all of us are struggling kind of in isolation, mm -hmm. kind of quietly mm -hmm. with this reality of caring for people who are living longer than ever, people that we love, people yeah. who raised us. Yeah. And that's why this story was so important. And the fact that we saw this family through generations of time and space and back and forth. We were able to see Rebecca go from being a caregiver and a mom to then needing care, sure. right? Um, we were able to see the family, the Pearsons kind of generation after the next, like navigate these experiences. And I think it helped us see as a country, the bigger picture I, Jen and I have talked about and wrote this op-ed about the conversation that your characters had after the Thanksgiving meal, uh, where Rebecca sort of gave her plan for her care. I need you all to hear my voice right now, your mother's voice with all of her faculties. You will not make your life smaller because of me. This thing that's happening to me will not be the thing that holds you back. So take risks, make the big moves, even if they're small moves. Forge ahead with your lives in any and every direction that moves you. I'm your mother and I'm sick. And I'm asking you to be fearless. Oh, oh I can't even imagine what it was like to shoot it. Forget about it. But it, <laughs> so much of what your characters went on mirrored so much of my journey and conversations that my family had. You know, we had, Seth and Seth was there, it was the first Thanksgiving after we were married and, and his parents came to Florida where my parents were living at the time and really got a clear picture of how taking care of my mom was really starting to affect my dad. Mm. And we sat down and had a very honest conversation and said, I respect that you wanna care for her, let us care for you. And I feel like so many people aren't able to have those conversations. Um, and you guys did it so well. Early on, when I was a teenager, I read in Teen Magazine that the best way to have a difficult conversation with someone was in the car. Because eventually your journey will end and you'll have to get out of the car. And so the uncomfortable conversation will end. And so this was early on in my mom's diagnosis and I wanted to have a conversation with her about how she was feeling, what she thought about all of this, so we were driving to Target one day when I was visiting and the conversation mostly happened in the Target parking lot, which is what's funny about it. But I asked her if she was scared and what she and what she wanted. And she said that she wasn't scared for her. And she was scared for us. Mm -hmm. And I was to not stop living my life for her. And to hear your character say that, you know, was so honest and so loving. And I think that people with dementia often don't have that moment to really, you know, say, what do I want? What do I want for my family? And you guys really laid that out so beautifully and so honestly. Yeah. <sighs> <laughs> what was that like for all of you? <laughs> <laughs> what? 
I think one of the most difficult parts of going on this journey with this character was not letting my own grief for the character, my own heartbreak yeah. infiltrate because there's so much resolve in Rebecca. This diagnosis was a chance for her to really recognize how she wanted to live the best version of her life. Mm. And to have that model to all of us, I was really inspired by that, but I was also so sad for her. I can't imagine how confusing, how isolating being diagnosed with dementia and cognitive decline, what that must be, and yet how empowering it must be to then recognize, like, I have the, the presence of mind and the ability to think about my future, not just for myself, but for my family, to eliminate any sort of family politics and messiness that might arise from an impossible situation like this. You know, I have this, like, deep collective history with Chrissy and John and Sterling and mm -hmm. Justin, like, have six years of experience with them in this narrative that we've all been telling together to just sort of look them in the eyes and, and also recognize the responsibility that we weren't just telling the story of this family, but we were telling the story of millions of families around this country and around the world. And I think we all like understood the weight and the importance of that and not just like focusing on the sadness and the grief and the heartbreak that does come along with a situation like this. Yes, yes, all of KJ, tell us about crafting that scene, that story. Mandy's journey from that Chinese restaurant and that, you know, the, when she got, I don't know if in, in season four, she got lost and was, you know, holding very close and very privately her suffering until it became terrifying for her and she was actually forced to share it. I mean, the show's about loss. Yes, it's about love and it's about family, but the thesis of the pilot that Dan so brilliantly wrote was this whole family generationally galvanized around the loss. And it was a sudden loss. You didn't have time to plan, you didn't expect it. And it was just a very particular kind of family bonding and reaction around that phenomenon, right? The exact opposite would be something like this disease. And it's certainly like a show that has a tapestry of memory, just like built right into it. What yeah. could be more perfect than to shine a light on that other version of loss, right? Yeah. Which is like, oh my God, it's low and slow. And Aggressive, you have all yeah. the time in the world. I'm myself and many people miss the boat on being able to sit the family down because the subliminal message is, what's too shameful to talk about. Yeah. I did not, with my family member, get the opportunity because I was following her lead and you feel like you gotta have the respect for the patient and let them lead and it's, it's a dance, right? Mm. So I hope that you're seeing that speech inspires people who are keeping it private and holding it in and feel, or feel ashamed. No, no, please look at it in the eye and look your loved ones in the eye and say what you need to say with your presence of mind because you might lose that presence of mind sure. and then people will be making decisions for you and they may not be what you want may not be what you want yeah, yeah. it may not be so what you want. hard to to be what you can't see and that's why the <laughs> representation question is so essential here what what we did what you did with that scene was model a way to have the conversation that was so grounded in rebecca's agency mm -hmm. and so grounded in the love that the family had We've never seen that on television. We never see that on the big screen or in our popular culture. That's one of the th reasons why we wrote the article we did. And why don't we see more conversations about care and Studio grappling? Studio <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think it's very uncomfortable yeah. for everybody, whether you're an executive or a writer or, but I think it's a really hard conversation to have. And like, when you have the conversation, it means it's real. And when it's real, then it becomes really scary. And then you're like, well, you know what, nah, let's just tuck this away. I think it's just really uncomfortable. Yeah. And people don't want to be uncomfortable. And that's why we have a lot of issues in our, in, in our lives sure. and, and how we, we fill the, the space and hole. And fear and apprehension. Yeah. 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 People are afraid, you know, I made it the joke, studio executives, but they... But it's true. <laughs> <laughs> but they are coming from a place of fear and apprehension because mm. well, yeah. this idea that the audience will, will reject us trying to tell that story instead of actually be drawn into it. Needing it. And, and be Needing inspired it. by it. Yeah. yeah, people react in a situation based on what they've been taught or from memory. And if they've 
watched enough times, uh, you know, something on television, maybe that inspires them, or in a film, maybe that inspires them to make a certain choice. And I think for a long time, we haven't told these stories. So they've just, you know, continually watched the, the John Wayne version of dealing with a, mm -hmm. you know, something like this, which sure. is like, be a man, suck it up, yeah. don't talk about it's it. It's not happening. And maybe a little bit of the obsession we all have with youth culture. Yeah. Yeah. Just, that's you know a good what I mean? Yeah. It's, there is a lot of apprehension around the conversation when it comes to death, death being a part of life <laughs> yeah. and yeah. end of life. Like all of that just feels very taboo. Right. And so it's another part of, again, like the legacy of a show like ours where we're able to sort of shine a light on those very difficult conversations that make it, you know, just important. It's amazing that he did it. Like, I, I've known Dan for a long time, and for the last few years, he's been saying, like, it's because he knows we're involved in this organization. And whenever I see him, he'd be like, you know, we're going to a very Alzheimer's y place. And I was like, of all the places you could take something like this, the fact that that is where he chose to take it and where, as a result, America will go with him, um, it's remarkable. You know, I've written about other diseases. So, like, it's, it's the hardest one to write about, you know? Like, we made a whole movie about cancer. The guy lives. Like, it, with this, that's not how it ever goes, you know? Like, and, and the fact that that is how he chose to end this, this thing that he dedicated a giant chunk of his life to, and all of you as well, is like, uh, it's from a creative standpoint, something I think is like, truly remarkable and like, entirely unnecessary in a lot of ways, as far as like putting your beliefs that are not easy to digest out into the world in a way that is like forcing people to digest it. We argued about it in the writer's room. Yeah, <laughs> were you like, why are we what doing were, this? What were the conversations? <laughs> like what, was, what were the conversations yeah. that you guys had? Too sad? Yeah. I mean, it kept coming back to... This is us thought it was too sad? Well, that's the thing. We're already reduced to a tissue box emoji. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Because, like, we work real hard to bring to bring all the colors, yeah. you know? Um, but we had tossed around other illnesses. Dan always knew the end of the series would be Rebecca's passing. Ultimately, we all agree that it just, on all of those levels in which it performs for us and opens up storytelling. It just was like, oh God, that's perfect. Oh God, that's perfect. Yes, it's sad, but that's also perfect. This is an important it thing is. to help destigmatize. Oh yeah, and it's have the most relevant... mainstream uh, representation of it that has mm -hmm. ever existed. And also probably the most realistic, which that's is right. like a real, mm -hmm. that's Thanks a sweet spot. We talk to caregivers all the time and we ask them if they feel like their experiences are reflected back. Mm -hmm. and they always talk about this as us. Like that's the number one right. thing that comes up. And they talk about how relatable and real it is that you have the ability to both talk about the joys and the love and the bonds and the hard stuff. Yeah. The stuff that is actually kind of ugly. It really helps people feel less alone in the experience mm -hmm. in the end, mm -hmm. which I think is one of the most important things you could do. Yeah, what a gift. Get ready for a lot of people coming up to you telling you very sad stories. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We've had six years of that, exactly. so I can only imagine. It's about to get so much more sad. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've cried with many strangers in bathrooms yeah. <laughs> many times. <laughs> Let's get your glasses on so you can see. She has full time. That you dismissed in the middle of the day. We're talking about permanent around the clock care to help you more. We are not questioning how much you love Kate, her. Kate, I am not leaving her side. Okay, this is every morning at 6.45, I am the first thing she sees when she wakes up. And it crowns her. It crowns me. So, as long as she needs me, I'm not going anywhere. John, I wanted to ask you about representing male caregivers. When we picture a caregiver, we're not picturing men a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. right. But there's, what is it, million? 36% of all family caregivers are men. Wow. Mm -hmm. And that scene where, you know, the kids are with you on the couch and you're so resistant to their help is so representative of conversations we had with my dad in that conversation at Thanksgiving that I had mentioned, but so important to show that caregivers are all types. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, for you, were you aware that as a male care caregiver, you were representing, should we say underrepresented 
group? Um, I, I don't think I was aware when we were filming it, but now that um, that episode has aired and people, I'm people have been sliding into my DMs <laughs> and talking about mostly men, yeah. uh, mostly sad men, yeah. sad men <laughs> sliding into my DMs. But they've been, you know, saying thank you for showing what I what I'm doing. This character, uh, being a caregiver for Rebecca character, gives men permission to actually let go of, like, as especially Latinos, that machismo, yeah. where, mm -hmm. we're, you know, you don't talk about what you're dealing with, you're suffering, you have to be a man. And that's a part of our culture here in America as well with, with men, is that we feel we can't be weak. We mm, can't, we can't ask, ask for, for help. help. Exactly. Yeah. It's heroic to yeah. be a male caregiver and to show other men this is what we should do for our loved one. Like being a caregiver for someone shows the the deepest love that you can have for someone. Yeah. One thing our, our, I think our show has always done is is make communication okay. Mm -hmm. We as as Americans we don't talk to each other. We never have. And I think that our show has shown people if you talk to each other you can heal wounds that are deep or mm -hmm. wounds that haven't even presented themselves yet. And I think that, you know, the conversation that, that Kate and Randall and Kevin had with Miguel, like that's a tough conversation to have, really tough. I think, you know, my character has been a piece of that storytelling. A real man is someone who can say, help me. That's mm -hmm. right. A real man is someone who can say, my job is to, to be there for, for my wife or for my daughter or for my grandmother or my mother, you know, I think that that's um, hopefully what my character's done. So well said. Chrissy, I was thinking about Kate's character, who is in many ways the classic sandwich generation family caregiver, panini between <laughs> caring for young children and caring for a mom with Alzheimer's. But then there's this other layer of Jack, who's blind. I'm just curious how much it was an explicit conversation about the kind of parallel tracks of caring for someone with disabilities and someone with a chronic illness like Alzheimer's and the similarities and differences or how that should show up? Yeah, I think, I mean, I sort of walk through my life with empathy. I don't have children, but like I've always felt like a caregiver because mm -hmm. I was a middle child. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to therapy, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so don't worry about me. Um, but, um, but I think Kate has always been that the, the sibling who, you know, she's sort of dealing with two alpha males, one twin. You know, she's sort of navigating, like, her place within the dynamic of, you know, jockeying positions of siblings. And I think that she found her way through love. And that was through loving her mother and loving, you know, through all of the, the hardships that and the relationship that they went through. And when she became a mother, she realized, oh, Rebecca only wanted what was best for Kate. You know, it was, it was always sort of felt like they were picking each other apart, but they really had this, like, undying love for each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that definitely moved into the love that she gave for, for Jack. And she was not going to let anybody, even her ex-husband, get in the way of that <laughs> and making sure that he was a priority. And also trying to balance her, her life because you can also lose yourself becoming a caretaker. Yeah, absolutely. Which is also really difficult because then you're going to need somebody to take care of you, you know, so it can become cyclical. It is such a selfless thing to be a caregiver and to come at it with such grace and heart and patience, mm. not taking it personally, that you haven't done the right things or you didn't do it soon enough or, the you know, the right way. And it becomes very complicated. Mm. I think that's one of the things that's so isolating about the caregiving experience is that we, we're kind of taught that, it's our personal responsibility yeah. and we've got to figure it out on our own. And if we can't, it's a personal failure, right? Right? Like yeah. we did something wrong. We didn't plan. We have the wrong job. We didn't save enough right. or whatever. In reality, we actually need collective solutions. Yes. We need a whole new approach to supporting caregiving families. And it starts with the conversations that John talked about. Oh yeah. And and that you're helping us have now. Yeah, I mean, I, show. I have another, every single day is a different conversation with my sisters regarding my mom. Mm. And it's ever evolving and changing. And, you know, even things that my sister didn't want to tell me. She's like, oh, well, remember when Rebecca said such and such? I'm like, she's usually in the show. Okay, this is great. <laughs> great, the show that I'm on is like helping us like, bridge the gap. This is amazing. 
So it's even, you know, making a, a huge impact in, in my life and in, in our circumstance, so. You said leading with heart, which I think is so important when you're caring for someone, whether it's with Alzheimer's dementia or, or someone else that needs any type of care. Um, something that you guys did so beautifully was how to interact with someone with dementia. Mm. The wedding episode where everyone's lined up for the photo, Rebecca calls Kevin, Jack, and everyone's like, no, 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 we, we just go with it. We yes and, you know, that yes. we as actors learn so well. Yeah. And you guys clearly understood the positive ways to speak to someone with dementia. And what was the process in incorporating those types of tools? It's an effed up disease, man. Mm -hmm. Like you, you have to start to lovingly sort of deceive and redirect, which feels really weird. And, and manipulative and like you feel like you're it's puppeteering. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's unnatural. Yeah. You feel like you're like puppeteering yeah. somebody, but it, it is it is actually quite a lovely thing to do to help them through because she kept asking where Miguel was. It's like 50 first dates, right? I mean, like, really, did we want Rebecca to relive Miguel's death every over over single over yeah, right. time? No. We get to that very specific episode where, you know, the whole episode is sort of centered around Rebecca being able to play this song at her daughter's wedding and just how important it is to her, to her family. Mm -hmm. and, I under <laughs> and I understood <laughs> that, you know, cognitive reserve works in a way in which, you know, if, if somebody who's in the, the throes of this disease has done something in the past and it's something like repetitive that they've, the doctor like assured me, yes, this is, this is something that is very doable for Rebecca. So that was really important to me. It was important to like understand yeah, our reactions. Right. It was important for me to understand from the caregiving's, caregiver's point of view, like what all goes into like the different exercises my my character might be doing at certain points to like help with her, like her mobility and all of that. Like if the television is on in the background, like obviously someone at this point in the disease is not gonna be watching the news, not gonna be watching something that's upsetting. The doctor's like at this point, at this juncture, Rebecca would watch Animal Planet. She'd watch something that like didn't require you know, uh, having to follow any sort of like narrative. You sort of have to reframe your point of view of like, okay, I understand like everything sort of has to be filtered through this lens. And uh, you know, it's like everything for us is, as actors is, is on the page. We're so lucky in that sense, but it's like, you also want to do your work to make sure that you're <clears throat> understanding where the writing is coming from. Yeah. In that very same episode to which you were referring about Rebecca mistaking Kevin for Jack, an unsung moment was Miguel, the caregiver, able to have a messy, angry, emotional outburst. I didn't need you calling out my handshaking, which is a harmless response to my medication, which I am handling. Okay. You know what I needed? I needed an hour to drink wine with someone. I needed just one minute to feel like a human being. I wanted to go with you because you drink wine and you appreciate it like I do. I just needed a day, Randall, because it is moving fast now. It is moving so fast that I have whiplash. What's moving fast? All of it. All of it. I thought that was one of the most vital scenes. That's right. Because, God, there is so much on the caregiver, there's yeah. so much that they have to hold inside and... And they're human. And they're human. Yeah, it was a really human moment. And I think that any caregiver watching that can understand sometimes yeah. you just need a fucking break. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we definitely get through a lot of it with humor, you know? Um, it's like playing charades with my mom in her particular situation. Mm -hmm. And so we have to laugh about it. But yeah, you have to let it release, let it go in some way, shape or form. I'd love to ask all of you if there were one thing that you would want fans to take away from the show about how we should show up for each other as families, what would that be? Oh, I think just showing up is the first and most important step, you know, mm -hmm. because there's so much fear, apprehension, but just like suit up and show up. Mm. And then, you know, you gotta, you gotta take it as it comes because it's literally gonna be different every, every yeah. moment, every day. And try to do it with patience and lots of love and grace for yourself and for who you might be taking care of. Um, 
but just to show up. I echo what Chrissy said, that every situation is going to look differently, and I, I just overwhelmingly hope that people feel a sense of community watching the show and recognize themselves and feel a sense of representation, and we're just, we're sort of opening that door ever so slightly to just have a more nuanced conversation around caregiving in general, around dementia in general. Um, I hope that's what the show sort of carries forth out into the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope that people um, are able to face aging a little easier mm -hmm. after our show. I mean, we, our show shows people at so many different ages mm -hmm. uh, and, and shows people you are aging, we are aging. Uh, the show's called This Is Us. It doesn't mean like the cast is us. It means all of us, like mm -hmm. you, the audience is part of us. So we all age and yes, there can be fear, but to face the fear of aging and do it gracefully and to do it with love and compassion, like she said, and, and, and understand that you never know what's gonna happen to you, to your loved ones, but just be prepared to talk about it with each other and to face it, even mm -hmm. though it's, it's fearful. We're human. We can. We're. We'll get through it. We'll get through it. We have resolve. You know. We, we'll. We'll all be okay. People forget that aging is living. That's what we're supposed to do. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Hopefully, through Re Rebecca's strengths, and you uh, make you, me cry because I wrote the episode where she. It's okay. I had the breakdown in the Chinese restaurant. I know, it was really I know. Personal. I know, I know um, it was. And she had the courage to go so far. And then to have the family not infantilize her afterwards. It's vital. I feel like that's vital because people in cognitive decline are still people. You can't quantify, you can't, Chris, you can't go inside and diagnose for your loved one just how much of a decline they have. Yeah. Um, and so you must always treat them with the respect um, and through the lens that you used to see their most dignified self. I don't know what part two was. <laughs> part one was good. Need a part, two. <laughs> part two was me reaching for the tissues. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway. Wow. This has been such, <laughs> such an interesting conversation. I know what I've taken away from it, which is that you guys have told a story that so many people can relate to. Yeah. And you've done it with humor, and you've done it with love, and your characters did show up for each other. And as humans, that's all we can do. Yeah. And it's so beautiful, and you've done just such extraordinary work. So thank you for the work. Thank you for this conversation. Thank, thank you. Thank you, for, thank you for, for your work. Thank work. you for everything. Your you. collective work is yeah, so important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh. Cheers. Have a breakfast Cheers. burrito. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And the one silver lining of this awful disease is that I have the opportunity to make a plan.